Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about it. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your minds not on divine things but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise so please be seated. This idea of taking up the cross, it's often, I think, sort of used in popular conversation as a kind of analogy or a metaphor for sort of putting up with something on an ongoing basis, something boring or unpleasant or difficult, just sort of trudging along, sort of carrying this thing which you'd rather not have. The thing is, Jesus' own sort of cross-bearing experience wasn't actually that long. It was probably less than half a morning. <coughs> and having borne it for a little while, for a couple of hours maybe, he was then borne by it and then died probably mid-afternoon. So the whole experience didn't actually last that long for him. So this picture that Jesus gives us isn't really a picture of long-term experience. I think he's trying to tell us, if you like, You've just kind of got to do what you've got to do. You've got to go through with it. And so, I mean, the basic thing is, he says, what profit a man to gain, his, to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? You know, what's the point? Yesterday, uh, in, um, in a little church in Mid Wales, we had a presentation from Open Doors. A man called Jim Stewart from Cardiff came up to give us a presentation. There are more people killed in Nigeria for their Christian faith than the rest of the world put together. For them, martyrdom, dying for their faith, is a common experience. Happens all the time. Every bishop in Nigeria has lost members to the Muslims who kill them for their Christian faith. And it happens all the time. I mean, there's thousands every year, so every day it happens. So for them, this, what will you do? Are you going to lose your life or will you gain it? It's a very, very real and at times urgent question. Are you going to do it or not? Famously, there's a, a girl who's kidnapped by Boko Haram. Boko Haram is a, a kind of Creole word. Haram means forbidden in Arabic. It's a kind of Islamic concept of that which is forbidden. And Boko is derived from the English word book. <laughs> So it's a kind of idea of books are forbidden. But boko has come to mean collectively those cultural things of the West which Boko Haram as an organisation consider inappropriate. So whatever they reckon is forbidden should be destroyed. And they're the ones that went out and kidnapped all those girls a couple of years ago. Now, most of those girls have now been released, having been told basically that they're going to convert to Islam or else. 
But there is one girl who just said, or else. And she simply refused to convert. And she's still in captivity. There's a reasonable assumption that she's still alive. But no one quite knows where she is. So for her, this question was very close. She had to make a choice, a very urgent choice, which she made. She chose. Would she rather forfeit her life or would she gain the world? And obviously she's not going to get the world, but she would get a certain amount of freedom. And that idea of facing it has been portrayed in a couple of films as well, actually, in what you might call popular culture. The Harry Potter films, interestingly, portray this, I think, very well where young Harry faces the enemy, Voldemort, repeatedly. And the curious thing is that each time he faces him, Voldemort is one way or another defeated. And it's because he has faced him that Voldemort is defeated. That's the kind of twist in the whole thing. If Harry simply ran away, he could, if you like, be stabbed in the back, he could be shot in the back. But because he's not running away, because he's facing him, each time Voldemort fails to kill him, if you like. And it's a curious thing that Harry knows he's got to do it. As the story um, unfolds, the first couple of times you might say are kind of flukes, but gradually Harry learns that he must face Voldemort. This is his job. He has to go through with it. And therefore he does it. He steals himself to it, he nerves himself, and he faces him. And the curious thing is, the most important, the, you know, the kind of linchpin of the whole thing, is that he allows Voldemort to actually kill him at one point in the story. But because of a kind of peculiarity in the things which have happened, Voldemort's killing spell can't actually properly kill him. But it only works because Harry has faced him, as it were. And I find that incredibly close to the story of Jesus, who obviously went to the cross, willingly. And then, um, funnily enough, there's another film called The Matrix. I don't know, has anyone seen the Harry Potter or The Matrix? Am I talking to a empty <laughs> space here? But in The Matrix, in the part three of The Matrix trilogy, it's not particularly well regarded, funnily enough, by a lot of people, but I think it's really good. And in the last section, you might remember that Neo, who now has this extraordinary power in the Matrix, when he finally faces the enemy, Agent Smith, he allows himself to be possessed by Agent Smith. And then at that moment, when Agent Smith has fully grasped him and reckons he's conquered him and finally you know, vanquished his enemy, he then... or. Um, Neo has allowed, uh, arranged for himself to be killed in his body. So that Agent Smith is effectively killed alongside him in that same stroke. It's almost exactly what it says in scripture that it says about Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin in order that sin might die. It's almost precisely how it's described in scripture. How the Machovsky brothers got that, I think, so right, I think, baffles me, because they've showed no signs of interest in theology apart from that. But those two moments in films, I think, epitomise perfectly the idea of turning around, facing it, and in that moment of vulnerability, actually conquering, which is precisely what Jesus did. He who knew no sin became sin in order that sin would die. He who had the immense power of the Son of God. He who said, if, if I wanted, I could call upon legions of angels. He says 10,000 legions of angels, 100 million angels, <laughs> if you felt like it. He with this immense power and authority, which could have simply vanquished any human kingdom on earth, chose instead to be weak and vulnerable on the cross. He just let it happen. But by doing so, he won, to put it bluntly. And Jesus knew that he had to do this. But this is not what you might call the normal way of things in the world. It is, you might say, counterintuitive. This is not how things normally happen in real life. 
And so all through the Gospel of Matthew, you have this gradually emerging picture of Jesus revealing himself by what he does. Showing himself by the feeding of the 5,000 and then the 4,000. Opening the eyes of the blind. Opening the ears of the dead. Delivering the Syrophoenician woman's daughter of the demonic possession. Healing the man born blind. And all these things as they go through the Gospel, gradually you realise how he is being revealed to the people for who he truly is, not for who they think he might be. And then in this very passage that we read today, Mark chapter 8, it actually comes, if you like, out into the open. Jesus says, well, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. That simple phrase. In um, one of the other Gospels, it says that Messiah and it was all that kind of thing, and then... Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. In other words, this is not something you would have known by yourself. The people that he's asked about, who think he might be John the Baptist or one of the prophets, whatever, this is the kind of normal way of thinking, the worldly way of thinking. This is, if you like, natural. But the natural way of thinking doesn't get the right answer. The only way the right answer comes is by Jesus opening the eyes the Holy Spirit opening the eyes of the blind, opening the ears of the deaf, that they can see and hear and know who he truly is. And that's not something which will come naturally. It is something which comes supernaturally. But then having made this wonderful uh, discovery and revelation, Peter then reverts straight back to type. And as soon as Jesus actually says, well, now that you know who I am, Now I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to win by looking as if I've been defeated. And Peter says, no, that's a stupid idea. You can't do that. That's ridiculous. What a terrible temptation for Jesus to actually go along with that. Because, of course, he didn't want to do this. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed and he said, Lord, take it from me. I do not want to do this. Everything in me does not want to go through with this. And yet I know I must. So when Peter said, surely not, he was just playing into that thing. He was, if you like, tempting Jesus to give in to that demand of his flesh, of his desire for comfort, his desire for anything except that. But that is the way, if you like, well, it's the way of the cross. It's the way of divinity. It's the way of holiness. It's the way of truth and righteousness. It's the way of the kingdom of heaven. It's the way of salvation. But then Jesus offers this further challenge. If anyone wants to become my followers, let them do the same. Let them face what they've got to face. Let them stand patiently Let them possibly lose the things they treasure or cherish. Maybe the things they like. The things that give them joy and happiness. Maybe let them lose their reputations, their incomes, their jobs. Maybe even their lives. But let them stand up and face it, knowing that this is the way of holiness. Those who are ashamed of me, said Jesus. In other words, if we flinch, if we turn back, it's almost as if we're ashamed of who he is. We don't hold fast. We don't stand by what he said and did. It's as if we're ashamed of him. And if we're ashamed of him, he says, he'll be ashamed of us. (laughs) So, which would we rather be? (laughs) Would I rather the Lord was ashamed of me or pleased with me? Why do I do what I do? The only thing which I really want, actually, at the heart of this, is I want to hear him say one day, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. That's, if you like, my pay. That's my reward. I want a pat on the back from my master. I want him to pat me on the head and say, good lad, good boy, you did right. And then I'll think, oh, 
<laughs> but in the meantime, it may not be that pleasant. In the meantime, maybe I've just got to face things I'd really rather not do. Maybe I've got to face people I don't want to face. Maybe I've got to do things I don't want to do. Maybe I've got to put up with nonsense that if I would just go the way of the world, it wouldn't happen. <coughs> and that's part of the reason why I welcomed that image or that, that visit from Open Doors. Because they remind me of what it means to be a Christian. When I hear about our brothers and sisters around the world, we don't have to do anything like that. And we don't have those decisions to make. And it's very salutary that it's you know, easy to feel a bit kind of, you know, gripey about <laughs> circumstances at times. And then you think about someone who's just seen their village ruined and their family slaughtered. You think, well, I haven't really got much to complain about by that standard, have I? But then, but then they feel compassion for us because they can see how our land and people around us are turning away from our inheritance in Christ. They can see how they're overturning the revelation of Scripture and this message of the cross. And they can see how people are turning away from this ancient faith and turning instead to strange gods and to heathen principles. And they feel compassion for us on that account. They actually feel compassion for us because they can see it happening. So our fellowship is, if you like, in two directions. I feel compassion for them on the dreadful suffering, the physical threat which they undergo. And they can feel compassion for us and the trials which we must undergo in our own way. But we're all sons and daughters of the Most High. We who are called together and called by his name. We have this fellowship together. And when the Son of Man comes, hopefully, he'll be pleased to see us. <laughs> we won't be ashamed. And hopefully, all of us will be together and just say, well done everyone, come and share your Master's happiness. Because that's what he's promised to do. May the Lord bless you all as you share your Master's happiness. In Jesus' name. Amen.